What's up, Degenerate Nation? Welcome to the Big Bets on Campus podcast presented by WinBet. This is the Week 8 college football betting preview. I'm Stucky, and with me, as always, is Colin Wilson. You ready to dig into some Arkansas Pine Bluff? <laughs> you mean a 51-point spread when your head coach tells you that we're all beat up and we really need a bye week? Oh, hey, here's the UAPB, uh, what, Zebras? This is kind of a, like, I, I wish you and I kind of got a bye week. We don't get a bye week. Yeah, we got to play every week here. So, uh, you know, no matter what the slate gives us, no top 25 matchups. Uh, we still got to dive in. We got plenty of things to bet on. Yeah, I apologize for my voice throughout. This is, I have bronchitis. I've been in bed for like two days, capping the card. I was just looking at my record for the year. I'm up one and a half units, 51 and a half percent. This is usually the time where we get hot. I can't promise another 24 and six bowl season, but I'm hoping this is my Jordan flu game weekend. And it kind of propels me, you, us to the end. Um, so, yeah, I was under a heated blanket two days straight. This is the only time I've gotten up to do this, to do a couple other podcasts. So, hopefully, I was able to find some winners. But after this, I'm going to sleep for. Uh, about 15 hours. So no bye weeks here. Let's get into the card. We'll start with where we always start, and that's look ahead or look away. This is when we look at next week's card, last week's card, and try to determine if there's any impact on this weekend's set of games, either from you know, just a, an emotional standpoint, does the team come out flat, or you know, a strategic standpoint, do they – you know, pull their starters a little sooner, not show much, et cetera, et cetera. So let's take a look here first at the biggest look ahead spots. And that would be you know, a huge game in the Big Ten next weekend between Ohio State and Penn State. We also have Northwest at Michigan and Michigan State, which we'll talk about next week before those teams have those meetings. So Michigan has to host Northwestern and Ohio State will go to Indiana. They're 21-point favorites at WinBet. Illinois goes to Penn State. Penn State's a 21-point favorite, also a 21-point favorite at WinBet at home. The status of quarterback Brandon Peters is up in the air. Sean Clifford was practicing. I doubt he'll play here. It just, I mean, he had a brace on. Why play him the week before Ohio State? My only angle here, I mean, I have nothing for – I think Ohio State's a little rich, but they've really turned it around as of late. Um, I have nothing in Michigan Northwest, and I'm curious to get your thoughts there. My only play in any of these three sets of situational Big Ten games is the under in Penn State, Illinois. I think that Penn State just wants to get out of this game healthy. But without Clifford, this offense, we saw what it did against Iowa. I mean, these quarterbacks, they can't do it. And Clifford's the only one on the team that can run the ball. They can't run it. Their offensive line has been bad. Illinois' offense is a mess. Penn State's defense should show up here. So I think this game is kind of ugly. And, uh, you know, Penn State gets out of here with like a 27-10 kind of win or something. So I played some under 46 and a half there, assuming that Clifford doesn't play. Because we saw that offense is without him. Uh, any thoughts on any of those three games? Yeah, I'll start with that one because I kind of had the same take. But the problem is that Sean Clifford was taking reps in practice the last two days, but it could be like emergency situation, right? We don't want to lose the Big Ten against Illinois. Yeah. Uh, and I mean, I'm a little nervous because I took this game on open figuring that Sean Clifford might be healthy and that would catapult it up to my power rank of 28. So the number definitely is taking into account that Sean Clifford is not going to play this game. And, you know, it just, even though Sean Clifford's practicing, the point spread hasn't moved. So obviously odds makers don't believe that he's going to play either. And laying this many points with Taquan Robert Roberson, it, it just did not have a good game in relief of Clifford against Iowa seven of 21 passing. It went from a really good offense to looking like the worst offense of the country. It, it was it was disgusting. And and listen, Penn, you're right. Penn State's rushing attack is progressively getting worse. 114th in rushing success rate, 117th in line yards. There's zero push from this offensive line. And, you know, that might get a pass this week because Illinois' defense is near dead last in almost everything. And anyone in the country can run on Illinois. Uh, but what's going on there with their program? Was Brett Bielema trying to – motivate uh the guys on his team or is he just 
does he just really hate this roster? Bielema came out this week and voiced his frustrations about how obviously the team that he inherited, that he didn't recruit, that none of these players are his, they're not getting the job done in the two deep. And then he specifically called out the offensive line, that I'm getting nothing out of the players that are on the offensive line. Uh, I don't think I've ever seen a head coach specifically, like not just bag on his team, but call out a unit for being horrible. I, so I don't know where Illinois' heads are at. If they come out a little fired up, a little pissed off because their coach said that they suck or, you know, maybe they, you know, quit on them. I, I don't know, but the number is interesting. I, I make it 28. The Clifford makes it 23, 24 and a half. But first half under for me is the way I would look. And the reason I say that is, is because if Penn State gets into trouble, I think you see Clifford in an emergency situation, maybe third and fourth quarter to save their Big Ten hopes because they can't lose this game. So I, I, I agree with you under all the way. I don't know what the Bielema angle is at all, but I guess we'll find out. That's fair. Anything in the other two Big Ten games? Well, the Ohio State team is like, I, I did a deep dive on it. And, you know, I, listen, Indiana's offense is something you just can't bet on. It's an inflated spread. I make it 16. I think SP Plus makes it 19. I mean, this number is huge. And then what you have to do with Ohio State right now is you have to accurately assess what the Buckeyes defense has been since the loss to Oregon. So let's do that. Tulsa beat the national average in success rate and standard downs and passing downs, but they failed in scoring opportunities. Akron was stuffed in 65% of the runs, but they met the national average in passing downs and had a, had a drive go over 10 plays. It's Akron against Ohio State's defense. And then Rutgers exceeded national average in all success rate splits. They even produced two explosive drives on offense. But again, once they got to the 40-yard line, they averaged 1.5 points per attempt uh, you know, in, in, in finishing drives. And then Maryland, exact same story. A national average killed it in success rate, two drives with 10-plus plays. A uh, terrible showing and scoring opportunities and two turnovers, of course, from Maryland. So I don't trust the Ohio State defense. I know everybody thinks that they're getting hot and lit up. And yes, their offense is college football playoff ready. C.J. Stroud is the fourth highest graded quarterback behind Bryce Young, Kenny Pickett and Grayson McCall uh, uh, per PFF. Now, Stroud is fantastic in pressured pockets, but uh, Indiana is not pressuring anybody. So the handicap is Ohio State can absolutely get all their yards here. They can get all their points all day, but I don't trust the defense. So I'm not sure if I'm taking Ohio state in an inflated spread, no thanks. Ohio state team total over that I can do. Well, the, the thing with the Ohio state defense is and that's going to be the key, whether or not they can win a national title is their defense comes along is in the first three weeks. And this is a guy I was screaming about for, you know, for the past years, Gary Coons cannot call a defense at this level if you want to win a national championship. So he, he lost his play calling duties and they were given to Matt Barnes who has taken over the past three games, but like, you know, they played Akron Rutgers and then Maryland without, you know, all of their receivers. So I, I still don't have a good read on, you know, Ohio state fans will tell you, okay, now our defense is different because of the play calling duty shift, which you can't get any worse than Coombs is doing, but I need to see it, you know, at home against Penn State next week, um, right. at Nebraska, you know, they had the Michigan State, Michigan at the end of the year. So uh, anything in Michigan Northwestern with our friend Bodog Jim? Yeah, Bodog Jim. I think you got to look at, you know, if it's Michigan or nothing here. I mean, the same as Penn State. Michigan gets to 24, and there's just mass resistance in the market coming in on Northwestern. Uh, there's some questionable injury statuses for a few players on the Northwestern offense, but this is an offense that has had an explosive touchdown and sustained some drives on Rutgers. Ryan Helinski is going to be under extreme pressure. And, you know, the offensive line that kind of skated against Ohio, Duke, Indiana State, their 88th in pass blocking and their top 10 pass rush defense of Michigan is just going to be all over Ryan Helinski. So I think it's kind of it's tough to take a spread that large with a Michigan team that is so focused on running the ball and they should have a ton of success running the ball. I mean, you know, 67% rush rate, but their tempo is 101st. Blake Corum may have a huge day. He averages 3.8 yards after contact and the Northwestern defense is near dead last in defensive rush EPA. So if you believe Michigan can bust explosive plays all day on the ground against Northwestern, which the stats say that they should, then this should be a cover. But again, this is a very much inflated spread again. So it's Michigan or nothing. All right, before we move on to some of the marquee games of the weekend, 
So you're looking at a couple of potential hangover spots after some big wins last week. LSU, everyone wrote them off for dead. Everyone said Eddo's lost the team. Then they win. They beat Florida. By the way, Debo, why are you not playing Anthony Richardson the whole time? He almost led him back to victory. Uh, but LSU wins. And then ironically enough, Eddo gets fired well, while we were doing the podcast uh, on the, the recap episode. We found out that breaking news. But LSU just you know losing so many key players. But they put it all together. They did not quit on Eddo. They now will travel to Ole Miss. Ole Miss off that win again at Tennessee where, I mean, the golf balls and Gatorade bottles. So interesting matchup here. There's a lot of questions about the quarterback situation with Ole Miss early in the week. Lane hinted back Corral, said it didn't look good. I was thinking that was gamesmanship potentially. You never know with Lane. Where does where do we stand there? And what do you see here? Well, it's interesting is uh, you and I were podcasting on Sunday. Coach O got fired. And then Brett and I podcasted on Monday and Nick Rolovich got fired in the middle of the podcast. So somebody's probably getting fired right now. I'm not exactly sure. Uh, listen, there's two big handicaps and you already mentioned it. Do the players respond to Coach O and does Matt Corral play? Now, uh, addressing the first one, you know, these players were, they came to LSU for Coach O. They came to play for him. Uh, they were recruited by him. The, he has a very close personal relationship with a lot of these guys. And when you listen to guys like TJ Finley uh, leave for Auburn, like he was emotionally upset about leaving Coach O. These players love him to death. So I think that they're going to respond. They did against Florida, and I continue, I expect them to keep doing that. Now, on Coach O's personal relationship with Lane Kiffin, uh, you know, Kiffin said he's an awesome guy and he's a phenomenal coach. Um, uh, listen, they have a very long history with each other. I mean, they're, they, you know, the USC ties, everything else. And it just doesn't sound like, you know, a coach that's going to try to run his opponent out of the building. If he can, that depends on, you know, what Matt Corral, if he's going to play, I heard the same thing from LSU. They don't believe at all that Matt Corral is, is going to be sitting on the bench, but if Corral is out, Kincaid Dent, John Reese Plumley, the playbook isn't going to change. It's going to be zone read handoff, hitting a vertical route. And we know Ole Miss is the fastest offense by tempo metrics, but does the 60% rush rate increase without Crowell or, or to keep, you know, Dent or Plumlee from throwing? You don't want Dent and Plumlee throwing the ball the way Crowell does. Um, so, you know, Florida was stuffed on 10 of 33 rushing attempts by the LSU defensive front. And for the season, they're above the national average in stuff rate, but the issue is the explosive play. Florida doubled the national average in explosive drives on this LSU defense. Um, and you know, this is defense is missing a ton of pieces out of the back seven. So while it's great that LSU did beat, Florida, you're missing both, both your corners now of like the potentially yeah. the best corner do in the country. Yeah. I think the big news this week is that, Hey, LSU beat Florida, but yeah. But if you look at the numbers, like Florida had a field day on offense, but the case for LSU to win, uh, you know, is to keep the Ole Miss offense off the field uh, a lot. What, you know, what Nick Saban did with, with, with Brian Robinson, just, you know, grinding them to a halt and not letting Crowell and the offense come out there. And Ty Davis price goes for 147 on Kentucky. He gets new run schemes and sets 287 on Florida. Now gets an old Miss defense. It's 120th and rushing success rate and they're 96th in tackling. Are they going to be able to get Ty Davis price? So it turns out like the director of performance and innovation, Jack Mariucci came up with these schemes. Uh, and now that's what the offensive line is running. And, and Ty Davis price is, is just going crazy. So you know, I mean, he had 11 missed tackles. He averaged four yards after contact. Ole Miss can't do anything with that. So, you know, I project Ole Miss minus seven and a half with Corral uh, and a total of 71. But obviously there's going to be plenty of explosive plays on both sides of the ball. The LSU defense is 20th in rush EPA. And, you know, they have a top 40 defense against standard downs explosiveness. And that's where Ole Miss lives. They just eat at explosiveness and standard downs. They rank first in FBS. So, you know, the biggest key numbers in the 70s are 73 and 76. So the under is certainly what I'm looking at with under 76, not 75 and a half. That's where I would cut it off. I think Ty Davis Price is really the player that can keep the Ole Miss offense off the field, trying to be like Alabama and Brian Robinson. So, uh, you know, you called it last week easy. You called an under in that Tennessee Ole Miss game. I, I think we have an under here too. Ole Miss has some uh, wide receiver injuries worth keeping an eye on too. Uh, at Winbet right now, the official – Odds provider of the Big Bets on Campus podcast. Ole Miss is a 
um, you know, sitting at minus 10 plus 100 over under 75 and a half. Another potential hangover spot is Purdue. They pick up that big win over Iowa in pretty dominant fashion. And now they will get a it will host a Wisconsin team that is fresh off of that, another grinder against Army at Winbet. Purdue is a three point home underdog. Over under is 40. Now, what we know about Wisconsin is they can't really throw the ball with Graham Mertz, but you cannot run on them. Their defense is elite. Purdue can't run the ball at all. So they're not going to, they might not get a yard here running the ball. And we know Purdue's defense has played at a top 15 level just this year. If you remove prior to the top 15 defense, you know, that Carl Aftis, he could be a top five pick at the end against double and triple teamed. New coordinators done wonders for that defense. I'm leading under here again. I think the, what will what will make or break this game is how much damage could David Bell do? He crushed Iowa, but that's that's how Purdue's going to have to make their living here is feeding David Bell and can Wisconsin slow him down because they're going to slow down the run. Purdue might not, is probably not even going to try to run here. What do you think here? Very good handicap because that's exactly the handicap where I was at. So I wanted to take Wisconsin minus three earlier today. Uh, the number moved across the board, win bet minus three and a half. Uh, we have some history here. In 2018, Jeff Brom beat number two Ohio State. We can thank Rondell Moore for that. Now David Bell is the guy. And if you go back to 2018, Purdue lost the next game to unranked Michigan State, and they had three turnovers. So, yep. you know, a win is a big game for them. If they're feeling pressure, a win here puts Purdue one step closer to winning the Big Ten West if Minnesota can take a loss. Probably shouldn't be too hard with that. But, you know, this this number is a buy at three, at three and a half. I've, I've really got to reassess, especially when you're looking at a Wisconsin team that has some issues scoring points. Well, the hook, but... that hook is even is the most <laughs> important thing in the world when you're trying to back Graham Mertz. Absolutely, absolutely. So, you know, both defenses have a strong advantage here. You know, George Carl, Carl Aftis, uh, he ranks eighth individually in the nation in pass rush productivity per PFF. And Graham Mertz adjusted completion percentage drops 25% in a pressured pocket. So that half point, like Stuck said, is extremely important. Uh, it's going to be a very slow drip of a faucet Wisconsin running game Purdue's defense is 78th and stuff rate. So even the, 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 you know, the, the running backs are going to be able to get their two and three yards and a cloud of dust. And that's exactly how the offense is going to move. Now on the other side, you hit it. What's going to happen to David Bell. Is he going to run wild like he did last week? And the Boilermakers, they have it in the advanced stats. They throw 60% of the time. They're 17th in passing success rate. They're terrible in standard downs but they're top 30 in success rate and explosiveness and passing down. So when they get behind schedule, they're able to go crazy and find David Bell and he does all the work. What you really have to do the handicap down is to where does Bell line up and who is going to be guarding him? So if you look at it, he lines up 13% of the time in the slot, 87% of the time out wide. So coverage from the corners is crucial for Wisconsin. That points directly to Caesar Williams, who should be fresh considering he only played eight coverage snaps against Army. Army doesn't throw. Uh, yeah. w- Williams doesn't have a huge rank in forced incompletions, but the 100 co- 150 coverage snaps he has, he's only been targeted 21 times. Like I, I think quarterbacks are obviously avoiding him. And in the nine catches against him, only 24 yaks have been allowed. So zero That's missed tackles. Against Bell. Extremely important. So the point is Caesar Williams is not going to force incompletions on David Bell. But the second David Bell makes the makes the reception, there's no yaks, no yaks, yards after catch been allowed at all. And the most important stat that you can find on Caesar Williams, zero missed tackles this year. Bell's going to get the ball, but the Wisconsin secondary is going to be right on top of him. I don't want to take the three and a half on Wisconsin. That's the play. The play is Wisconsin. I really don't want that hook. Well, right now at Winbet, it's three flat. Uh, Dig it. <laughs> so I agree with you. I agree on Wisconsin. I would I would actually lead under two. Um, another under in Wisconsin. Shocker. Last spot here is Utah after their big win. Emotional week for Utah, right? They went yeah. to that the funeral in Texas, and then they come back, and then they have a comeback win over Arizona State. Now the wide open Pac-12, and this game will go a, a long way in determining both divisions. Uh, Utah is a three point favorite at Oregon State, over under 56 at Winbet. I actually, oh, by the way, you've so you had Utah last week, guy, and Arizona State last year. 
Last year I was beating you at all, all the head to heads when we were against each other. This year you're beating me at every one. <clears throat> so I hope that you're not on Utah again. I did play some Oregon State. I think it's an awful spot. I mean, Oregon State's coming off of a bye. Utah had an emotional week, beat Arizona State in a you know big game on deck, going up to Corvallis. This is might be the biggest game in Corvallis in 10 years. Not enough people are talking about now. Look, I, one of the weaknesses that I said, and you nailed it with Arizona State last week, 13 penalties for 115 yards. Arizona State still ran for over six yards per carry if you remove the sacks at the very end of the game. With their So they were, they were running it. You can run on this Utah team. Not enough people are talking about this Oregon State offensive line. I think they're number one in line yards. I think they're going to be able to move the ball on the ground. I think this is a flat spot for Utah. I took the three at home uh, with the Beavs. I'm hoping you don't disagree because you would beat me and he's had to head. <laughs> I 100% agree with you, but I haven't made a play on Oregon state. I took a different angle at this. So by the time this game kicks, Oregon state could be playing for sole possession of the North and wow. Utah had, like you said, Utah has to, because the UCLA Oregon game is earlier in the day. And I guess we'll talk about that one later, but Oregon state may be coming out of the locker room onto the field with a ton of pressure on them, uh, you know, to own the North, which is a shock. But, I mean, you got to look at Utah, just this emotional week of practice, a big win to, to lead in the South. And if you go and look at their box scores, it just it wouldn't surprise me from the least if we have an extremely slow start from Utah. If you look at it since Cam Rising has taken over as quarterback, seven points in the first half against Arizona State, seven points in the first half against Washington State, 10 points in the first half against San Diego State. This is not a Utah team that is, like, ready to play the first 30 minutes. I, I don't know what's going on with these guys. But the Utes are just not a first-half team. Oregon State comes off of a bye week after a loss to Wazoo with a, a Chance Nolan interception. Uh, that was the driver for the leading score in the third quarter by the Cougs. The Beavers lead the Pac-12 in time of possession, and they've ran 288 plays in standard downs to your mention of that offensive line going crazy. Oregon State, 288 plays in standard downs, only 116 in passing downs. Oregon State is number one in the country, not just in line yards, standard down success rate and any any down and distance when you obtain 6.1 yards per carry on first and 10 on second and seven you're moving the chains every time so we talked about the handicap last week being utah's defense is great and stuff right they can they they can get behind the line of scrimmage but if they don't there's going to be explosive runs and that's uh, there was a lot of arizona state explosive runs and they also got stopped that comes into play here once again utah's 13th and stuff rate. They're 76th in standard down success rate. So Utah's bread and butter is ninth nationally in tackles for loss per game. Utah gets behind the line of scrimmage real fast on defense. If they don't hit behind the line of scrimmage, there's going to be very long sustained Oregon State drives in this game. I think that plays into the, the plus three, you know, very well. I, if you're playing the Beavers plus three, that's the reason why is, uh, you know, they're, they're going to be able to avoid this Utah defense. Another area to worry if you're Utah, Oregon State is third in finishing drives. You would say that doesn't make very much sense because they're 77th in the red zone. But if you take a clean, that's why I don't like red zone numbers, right? First off, you're only getting 20 yards of data. Second off, it's just like score or not. Uh, finishing drives is such a much better stat. So take a look a little bit closer at what Oregon State is doing when they get down there. 25 scores for Oregon State this season, 21 of them have been touchdowns. 21 of them have been touchdowns. There's no field goal kicking here. So keep an eye on the status of Jake Levengood at the left guard. He's one of their best blockers. He's questionable with an ankle injury. But if he's good to go, this Oregon State team is going to run all over the place. So Utah can certainly counter on offense. Oregon State's outside the top 100 in rushing success rate on defense. They're 119th in tackle grading, pretty terrible. Cam Rising gets a, gets a pass rush that ranks 100th. So it's just going to take time for Utah, if they can, you know, if they can come out and show some life in the first half, which they've never done, if they can, you know, catch up before it's too late, you know, they're going to be able to get some work done in here. So, I mean, there's a high rank of 11th for Havoc on the Oregon State defense, but that's all passes defense. Uh, Oregon State is third in the country in PBUs per game. So if Utah is going to win this game, it's got to be on the ground. And saying that, Utah knows that they're going to probably keep it on the ground. Oregon State's going to sustain drives on the ground. They're going to win time of possession battle. Utah frequently comes out slow. The Beavers back seven is leading units in the nation in PBUs. I like your plus three. I'm playing first half under. I don't think Utah shows up in the first half under. It could be a lot of pressure on Oregon State being the North lead. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of things here. Ground, ground game based both sides. Uh, 
I'm waiting for the steam though. I know it hasn't come through on the action app. The over steam is still going. I want to get that 28 and a half for the first half to get the under on that. The full game, the key number, like one of the biggest key numbers is 59. Fourth highest key number in totals. I'll wait to see if we get that. Once they do, I like the under. Fair enough. Good handicap there. Let's talk some marquee matchups of the weekend. All right. So we have five games here that we'll cover. All right. Let's start with Brocktober. We have Iowa State is a seven point home favorite at Wimbet over under 48. I can tell you, I kind of like this under, and I like Iowa State laying seven. I cannot tell you. Like, if you look at from an adjusted EPA perspective, so if you adjust for home field and competition, these two teams have similar defenses that have played really well all year. But the Iowa State offense is actually decent. The Oklahoma State offense is atrocious. If you look at Iowa State, which has two losses, they outgained Iowa by over two yards per play. By, you know, they hold them under 200 yards. They lost to Baylor on, you know, they should have beat Baylor. They outplayed Baylor. There was a kick return for a touchdown. And then you look at this Oklahoma State team. I mean, when is this going to end? I mean, you there's things that aren't even showing up in, like, post-game win expectancy. They had no business winning that Texas game. Texas is about to go up 24-3, to and they throw a pick six. Uh, Boise State beats Oklahoma State, but the refs blow the whistle. And they just start, decide that Boise State's not allowed to run the fumble, and then Boise State misses a field goal. They get a kick return at the end of the Tulsa game. And they had a third, a third and 19 that was, wasn't reviewed when they scored a touchdown on. I mean, insane. This is a team that barely beat Missouri State to open the season. Their offense is dreadful. What, what did they do against Texas for the first – that whole game? Nothing on offense. I guess Texas is defense. I don't know how this Oklahoma State team scores against Iowa State, to be quite frank. So uh, I'm laying the seven all of Iowa State money line. In some kind of parlay, maybe multiple, and I kind of like the under as well. The Iowa State offense isn't going to wow you, and Oklahoma State's defense is really good. They match up well here. They they can match up with their tight ends that Iowa State loves to throw to. <clears throat> but I think Hall will do enough on the ground. Per I mean, it's it's October. He'll make enough throws. Iowa State wins this by two touchdowns. What say you? 100% agree. Uh, this is a must-win game for both teams to keep up with Oklahoma in the Big 12 race. Uh, give Oklahoma State credit as they look dead to rights with Texas about to punch in a TD to go up 24 to three. And that game got turned around in a hurry with an 85-yard pick six. And a few weeks ago, I was boasting about Texas and Sark putting up Alabama-like numbers and available yards, getting 90% when the national average is 44%. The Cowboys limited Texas to just 29% of available yards. I was a little bit surprised by that. I mean, Texas was stuffed on 12 of 30 runs and they only scored, Texas only scored on explosive plays. So for Oklahoma State to win this game, they must eliminate Iowa State explosive plays. And so far this season, the Pokes defense has kept opponents under national average in every success rate split, but they've allowed 16% of drives to be explosive, well over national average. So wouldn't you know it? The Iowa State offense is one of the most explosive in early downs. 25th and standard downs explosiveness, which is where Texas attacked and where Oklahoma State ranks 72nd on defense. So Jim Knowles has the Cowboys as the third best defense against explosiveness and passing downs, but it's the first and 10 and the second and seven where offenses are getting behind the Oklahoma State defense. The spread is interesting for Iowa State. I mean, this is Brocktober, uh, but this is a series that has been decided by one possession every year since 2014, almost like clockwork in late October, this Iowa State team is rolling right now. 69 offensive possessions. They've doubled the national average in explosive drives. Brees Hall had a slow start to the season through his first two games. Now he's had 18 runs of 10 yards or more over the last four games. I mean, the Iowa State offense. Is, I don't think he was healthy early on. Now he is. And, and as, yeah. as with the rest of their offense. Yeah, yeah. That, that I remember. So they almost held him out of that first game against Northern Iowa. And they, they, and they probably, he probably would have been better production for the Iowa game, but I mean, can't stop fumbles down at the goal line. But I mean, talking about Spencer Sanders getting to face the 3 3 5 and an Iowa State pass rush that ranks 32nd. Despite beating Texas, Oklahoma State was below national average and success rate in every split on offense against Texas and almost a full yard per play lower in passing downs. So on the season, Oklahoma State offense is below average and explosive drives below average two plus first downs and Spencer Sanders has more turnover worthy plays than big time throws. I mentioned that Iowa state will get pressure on Spencer Sanders. That is a huge factor in this game. 
in 47 pressured dropbacks a season, Spencer Sanders has one big time throw and five turnover worthy plays. His adjusted completion percentage falls 32%. And I mean, that just hasn't changed. That's been classic Spencer Sanders for years. You get any kind of hand in this space and, and anything could happen from a havoc perspective. This is an Iowa state play at seven. I, I'd like to avoid the seven and a half, but there's a big difference in tackle grading here. 13th for the Cyclones on defense, 103rd for the Pokes on defense. That's a bad variable to have for the Cowboys against an explosive offense. So Brocktober, baby, minus seven, let's go. Yeah, the, the Oklahoma State lock has to run out. <clears throat> has Brett's going to run gonna out hate us. Oh, Brett's going to hate it all, everything about this on Saturday morning. Yeah, big bets on campus live, 10.30 a.m. Eastern uh, on Twitter. We'll tweet out the link. Uh, second marquee game of the weekend here. We have Tennessee, a 25-point underdog, traveling to Tuscaloosa to face Alabama over under 67 and a half. Um, I, I think, look, Alabama is a weird team to figure out. They Some some weeks they look great. Some weeks they look like they have major issues. I don't even know if I can take too much away from last week on the defensive side of the ball because in the first quarter, Will Rogers gets hurt. And he, he's, he's holding his shoulder the entire game. He can't make any throws um, and throws three picks. He was just late. And I don't know why they kept him in that entire game. He said that he had a couple of MRIs this week. He had a sprained uh, MC joint. But the Alabama offense, I mean, the Mississippi State defense is good. It's just doing whatever it wanted. Tennessee, meanwhile, I was really disappointed. They, they got they got the shaft on a couple calls. Bad, bad weekend for the SEC reps. But – I mean, that's the old miss off defense. I'm surprised that he couldn't put up more. Hendon Hooker did get hurt at the end of that game. That's huge here for me. I would like Tennessee if I could guarantee that he's going to play. I think the slide is inflated. But if it's Joe Milton, I don't want any part of it. And I keep Hooker was practicing this week. Same with Cade Mays, one of their best offensive linemen, who's bagged up. But, like, I think it was a hamstring. And do you really want to risk him here? against Alabama I don't know that's but that's the handicap here for me if I could guarantee that Hooker was playing and healthy I would play Tennessee if not it might just be a pass yeah this is a tough deliverable for our podcast listeners because the number is completely dependent upon Hendon Hooker playing we don't know he's questionable he suffered a leg injury against Ole Miss but it's not just that center Cooper Mays right tackle Cade Mays they didn't play for much of the Ole Miss game now running back uh, Tyon Evans is also questionable for this game and if you're missing all these offensive pieces, you can understand why this is more than a touchdown than what the projected point spread would be if all those guys were healthy. Uh, the one thing we know about Hypel, it doesn't matter who's on the offensive line and it doesn't matter who's quarterback, he's going to run tempo. And I feel like that is like the worst thing ever. That's like Jon Snow running into Ramsey's army, you know, like in the Battle of the Bastards and Game of Thrones. Like, what the hell are you running tempo against, against Saban for? Like, welcome to the SEC. So I, one of the reasons that Alabama struggled with Florida and lost to Texas A&M was that their defensive units uh, in the trench just failed them. 60th in pass rush. The defense as a whole is 73rd in passing success rate and 102nd in finishing drives. And opponents have scored on 16 of 18 red zone attempts, 10 of those being touchdowns. Tennessee is a top 25 unit in offensive finishing drives. But like I said, if they don't have these players there, then it's hard to rely on these numbers. The Vols run 64% of snaps and they rank 10th in rushing success rate. That, you know, you kind of go back to that Florida game and the Gators ran 60% of attempts and they, you know, they, they, they weren't stuffed at all. And they averaged 5.9 yards per play on the ground. They were able to beat Alabama by grinding on them. So Tennessee has to have a healthy offensive line. Evans and Hooker have created 50 missed tackles in the running game this year. That's, that's crazy. If those key players are out, then this game is going to be over fast with Hypel trying to run tempo. So I think if those players do play, if there is one betting deliverable from this, if Hendon Hooker is playing and the Mays kids are on the offensive line and Evans is playing a running back, then Alabama is probably in one of these modes where they want to be a, get a 21 point lead and let Brian Robinson just plow. They're heading into a bye week after this. They've got LSU in two weeks. They're heading into a bye. They probably would like everybody healthy. This may be the one time that Saban doesn't care about covering an inflated spread. So, you know, I'm not saying that you should be betting on the under or that you should be betting on Tennessee, but if all of those offensive players are healthy, there's a lot of value in this Tennessee number. Now, you know, <laughs> they have to play and that's going to be last minute information. 
So if that number is still sitting up there and we get Hendon Hooker, Evans, the Mays kids on the offensive line, then Tennessee is the play. But, man, I, it's really tough supporting a tempo offense going into the teeth of Alabama. Yeah, it's a really good point. Uh, next game here, this is your chance to convince the audience <laughs> of it over. A San Diego State over. Undefeated San Diego State heads to Air Force, Colorado Springs. Air Force three and a half point favorite over under 39 and a half. This is a huge showdown in the Mountain West. Yes. Air Force only has one loss on the season. Go ahead. I'll hand, I'll hand I mean, you love this. I, you, you know what I, you know, every week we get into the, you, you tweet at me and you talk to me on the pod, but you love this shit too. You know why? Because you love the punter. You love Matt Areza. Ray guy. I mean, this guy's what? 86 yard punt against San Jose state. He's a, uh, he's what averaging 55 yard field goals. I mean, he's, <laughs> he's been unbelievable. 359 yards a game and punting. I mean, this kid is a, this kid's an animal. So uh, you love this shit too. But uh, l- listen, if you now want- he's going to altitude, imagine how far he's going to punt. I, oh, <laughs> Katie, I didn't even think about that. I'd like to see this kid's punt. This kid's single punt go up against Bryson's like flop wedge. I wonder which one would go farther. Anyways, so if you want to be an Air Force football, you must be good at A, stopping the run, B, being elite in stuff rate because of the triple. The triple often, a triple option offense isn't so much at looking at the line yards. Line yards are important when you're looking at ground-based attacks, but triple option is a little bit different because you got to stop fullback first. And stuff rate is important because it grades the line of scrimmage and the tackles for loss. Air Force is fifth in rushing success rate with their triple option, and they have an offensive stuff rate rank of eighth. That means not a lot of people are stuffing them whatsoever. Air Force is seventh in the nation in tackles for loss allowed. Nobody's getting behind the line of scrimmage. They average just three and a half tackles for loss per game. So you have to ask, who is elite in getting into the backfield? San Diego State. The the Aztecs are third in tackles for loss per game. They average eight and a half per game. But the most important stat is that the Aztecs are second in defensive stuff rate. It's truly a power on power battle when the Air Force triple meets up with the San Diego State front seven. So it's good on good. And there's only two teams the Air Force schedule have stopped the Air Force attack above national average, Wyoming, uh, whose defensive line is you know really good and from a G5 level, and then Navy, who practices against the triple every single day. But Brady Hoke is just – he's no stranger to Air Force whatsoever, and he's no stranger to Troy Calhoun. When he was at San Diego State in 2009, 2010, he's faced them. San Diego State has won eight straight in this series, dating all the way back. Hoke and Calhoun first faced off, you know, maybe 12 years ago, but – you know, Brady Hoke also f- had to see him when he was at Michigan. He had a, I think Michigan was ranked number 19 and they barely escaped for their life against Troy Calhoun. Every time they play, it's a one possession game. Lucas Johnson is going to step in here starting quarterback. He, uh, Brady Hoke said he's got the hot hand uh, and he got the win against San Jose state in relief. He averaged 6.8 yards per carry. Uh, but you know, he averages 6.8 yards per carry on the season. A lot of that came against Utah. We have to monitor Greg Bell, running back Greg Bell, and left tackle Zachary Thomas. Zachary Thomas is the anchor of this offensive line. Both of those guys missed practice on Tuesday. I haven't been able to find a report about their status for this game. They're not even listed as questionable. They just missed practice on Tuesday. So uh, that is something I'm monitoring before I make a play on this. There is a monster gap in special teams here. We talked about it from the punting standpoint, but San Diego State is 14th and Air Force is 112th. So San Diego State's got the defense to defend the triple option. Brady Hoke knows how to go after the fullback. He knows how to go after pitch. He's seen Troy Calhoun way too many times in his life. So if the market wants to give me three and a half and a game that I personally feel is going to go to overtime, I'd bet an overtime prop on this game. uh, Much like last week, I would happily take three and a half. I do need Thomas at left tackle and Greg Bell in the backfield. If that's there, give me the Aztecs. So is that why you're recommending the over? Are you counting on overtime here? (laughs) You know how hard it was not to bet over 19 and a half live? God, that was I was like, this is definitely going over. There's no way this isn't going over. Uh, I like the under here. Um, <laughs> all right, our next game, Oregon at UCLA. UCLA is a one and a half point favorite over under 59 and a half. Uh, this is a pretty ugly card this week. Oh, by the way, make sure you check out our uh, our group of five guys who have been killing it, uh, Mike Calabrese and Ionello, they uh, they're on a nice run. They hit the round robin again last week. Uh, so make sure you check that out. 
on uh, Wednesday afternoons. All right, so Oregon at UCLA. UCLA, one and a half point favorite at home. I played UCLA here. Um, look, we we saw Oregon get that win in the opener against Ohio State. I said, whoa. But, you know, you go back and look now, and it's like, all right, Kerry Coombs, defense at Ohio State. Like, And we've seen Oregon since. We thought this Oregon team coming to the year was extremely overrated. We are not fans of Anthony Brown. There's there's even articles this week that are saying that Oregon had to come out and say that no, we're sticking with Anthony Brown. Like fans are calling for the backup. But this is a pretty simple handicap for me. UCLA this year on defense has been very good against the run. Their defensive line has been very strong. They've been a little vulnerable in the secondary. Well, I don't trust Oregon to exploit that with their downfield passing attack. On the other side of the ball, you could run on this Oregon team. I think UCLA is going to control the line of scrimmage on both sides of the ball. Uh, I expect Phillips, their best receiver, to be back this week. He didn't play last week. And uh, DTR has looked healthy dealing with that shoulder injury. So I think that that's the handicap for me. I like UCLA just because of the matchup on both sides of the ball. I don't think Anthony Brown can take advantage of UCLA's secondary with downfield passing. And I think UCLA's heavy rush attack can have success against Oregon. Thoughts? Yeah, 100% agree. Again, I mean, maybe this could be either a really bad week or a really good week. We'll have to have maybe the San Diego State overall figure it out. But you say it was the first play I made when lines were released on Sunday. Uh, I pushed as much money as I could over the counter, and I would play it up to three. I mean, these two teams both run at a 60% clip. Passing downs being the Achilles for both. Both these top offenses are top 10 and stuff rate, meaning they control the line of scrimmage and they run all day. The difference is tackling. Oregon has struggled. They have a rank of 104th in tackling, and UCLA is up to 55th. And you say, well, 55th isn't that great. Go take a check out on 2020 stats for the UCLA defense. Another problem with the Ducks, the defense is not generating any havoc. I mean, zero havoc whatsoever. At this point in the season, they have 22 PBUs. Uh, it's just not enough. They're 111th in coverage. And the only reason I talk about that is if UCLA, for some reason, is not able to run the ball on first and second down, and Doreen Thompson Robinson, the game, you know, we're not going to have the game depend on his arm, but if it does come down to passing downs, Oregon's not forcing their will on anybody. They're not making anybody scramble. They're not making anybody sweat. Their coverage rank is outside the top 100. So, you know, still to this day, like Dorian Thompson Robinson is having his best year ever as a UCLA quarterback. Uh, you know, he's not making any turning work, turnover worthy plays. He has yet to have a bad game and consider that the past three years, he had 44 turnover worthy plays. I mean, it's a really a pretty amazing season what they've done there with him to get him to eliminate mistakes. So, not only is UCLA better when it comes to establishing the run, they are extremely creative. And you wonder, you watch that LSU game, the reason why that LSU game was just a masterpiece by Chip Kelly, the Bruins ran nine different formations against LSU. They disguised every single thing they wanted to do. Uh, you know, Oregon does get Joe Moorhead back. There is that aspect to the game. Joe Moorhead was not there for the Stanford game. They lost. Then Joe Moorhead, because of COVID protocols, had to be in the box last week. Uh, they almost lost to Cal. He gets to get back on the sideline. So that is a boost. I'm not sure. But that, what is that boost? The communication, like the speed, the tempo. Uh, I mean, the tempo was actually faster when he was gone, believe it or not. I mean, I heard some people say, well, the, well it's definitely going to go over. It has nothing to do with Joe Moorhead being on the sidelines. They averaged 24 seconds per play when he's on the sidelines and 22 seconds per play when he wasn't on the sidelines. So that doesn't make any sense. But the Ducks offense has been fantastic with Anthony Brown in the running game. And they have a success rate 70% higher than national average. But you're right. Line yards for UCLA, they rank fifth. Uh, so, I mean, they're going to be able to stop the run. And without C.J. Verdell, this Oregon rush unit is just – there's no depth. All the running backs have been on the roster have told have been told, you're in the rotation, you're getting carries this week. And that could lead to fumbles. But, you know, if the Oregon rush attack isn't gaining yards without Verdell, it's curtains. It's over. Chip wins this one, and the Pac-12 is done as far as the playoff is concerned. Yep, completely agree. Uh, last marquee game of the week is uh, the ACC favorite hosting Clemson. Pitt is a, can you believe this, a three-point favorite at Winbat over Clemson. What was this What was this preseason line? Over 17. Clemson, that's what I had to be, 17. Uh, over under 48 
When you look at Clemson adjusted EPA for play, they are slightly worse than they're, they're basically Iowa. Like if you look, if you chart their offense and defense, defense still elite. Our offense is terrible. They're, I mean, like you could not tell if you had profiles without their names. Adjusted EPA for play. It's Iowa is Clemson. This team can't do anything on offense. Um, so the defense is still elite. So it comes down to can Kenny Pickett continue? He's just continuous toward pace. He's just ripping apart offenses. The offensive line has been tremendous. They had a lot of drop issues last year. Those have gone away. Uh, the offense is rolling. The defense is playing really well. It's an aggressive defense. We talk about this all the time. Man, press man islands on the on the corners. They play a lot of quarters day. So you can attack them with explosive plays. I don't know if Clemson's capable of doing that right now. Um, so, uh, look, at Dabo, by the way, Dabo! Oh, there, my throat to yell. Dabo is 0-6 against the spread. Here are the teams that haven't covered yet this year. This is the company that Clemson's in now. New Mexico, 0-7. Kansas. Does Kansas ever cover? Good Lord, they always get steamed, too. Kansas, 0-6 <laughs> against the spread. And Missouri. Missouri is 0-7 against the spread. Uh, what do you see here? Yeah, for I me, want Dabo to go 0 and 12 against the spread, and then 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 we'll fade him in the uh, in the uh, Bad Boy Mowers Gasparilla Bowl. It'll go 0 and 13 against the spread. The Bad Boy, yeah, the the Gasparilla Bowl. Which, by the way, I had a talk with my grandma this past week, and I said we're going to play bowl, not a bowl. And I started asking her things like, "Is there a such thing as a as a in and out bowl?" And she's like, "Yeah, there's an in and out bowl." So I, whenever we get that video, oh, it's a fantastic game. It's it's going to be great. I have been very aggressive in adjusting Clemson, uh, extremely aggressive. They are dead last in big play rate on offense. They're 124th in passing success rate. Uh, they can't run on anybody. They can't score when they're in scoring position. Um, the defense is now 83rd in pass rush. What? This is a Brent Venables defense that's 83rd in pass rush. How is that even possible? And you know, Pitt is a top 10 team as far as pass blocking goes and keeping Kenny Pickett clean. The issue that I have with this game is that I don't know how anybody's going to score. Uh, you know, Pitt far outranks. Uh, Pitt has enough defense easily to shut down what Clemson wants to do offensively. But when you look at the other side, Pitt's number one in the nation in offensive finishing drives. They're number five in big play rate in the nation. But the problem is the Clemson defense is number one in defending big plays, and they're number three in defensive finishing drives. So uh, – I have a hard under, time making under. Yeah. Under is the play for me. I mean, it's a game that I project 49 looks like we're down to 48, 48 is way more key than 49, believe it or not. Uh, so if you can get 48 or 48 and a half, then under is going to be the player because I just don't see with the pace of play and the D when, what the defenses bring to the table. Uh, I don't see many points being scored here. I agree again. That's the side that I was looking at. It's a big step up for Pickett in competition because the Clemson mm -hmm. defense is still elite. All right, let's move on to a little rapid fire and hit the rundown. Uh, I'll throw a game out first. Wake Forest Army supporting the troops here. This Wake Forest team has gotten extremely fortunate. They should not be undefeated. I think their run ends here. Look, it's a good spot for Wake in situationally. They're coming off of a bye. Army just played Wisconsin which, you know, physical game against Wisconsin. But this is Army. Like, they don't really have situational bad spots. Like, they they, they just always show up. And uh, take a look at Wake Forest. What are they? 112th line yards, 123rd opportunity rate, 90th stuff rate. They played Syracuse, who's like a, a, they just want to run it out of the shotgun. Syracuse should have beat them, ran wild. So I, I think that these two teams basically – profile very similarly uh if you look at adjusted epa per play and i'm getting arby at home and uh catching three give me give me give me i'm on the black knights yeah i mean wake has not been good against the rush 112th defensively in success rate 90th or i'm sorry you 90th in stuff rate you mentioned the line yards i think for me this is a i need confirmation that christian anderson is going to play now dave clausen came out and said we are preparing that christian anderson is going to play if he's playing for army at quarterback army's going to win this game flat out you know as far as the wake offense goes army's 36th in coverage grading and they're 28th in tackling so they're not terrible against the pass now they were this kind of reminds me of when western kentucky came to town right up tempo offense pass happy explosive plays Western Kentucky was down for more than a half before they came back and almost won the game in the fourth quarter. So 
Wake Forest doesn't excel in standard downs. As a matter of fact, they're 79th in success rate, but they do excel in passing down success rate. They're top 10. So Army allows just 4.8 yards on defense when teams get behind schedule. So Wake has to have some success rate here. Army's just going to drain clock and run it all over them. A bad rush defense for the Demon Deacons. If Christian Anderson is confirmed in playing, I think Army wins outright. I agree. Yeah, I'm assuming Anderson is playing this weekend, but that's that's a good point to raise. Uh, your favorite team in the country, Notre Dame, back in action. <laughs> Six and a half point favorites at home against USC over under 56 and a half. Are you fading the Irish? I, uh, I It's crazy. I actually am not. I'm going to point everybody over to our Action Network write-up. I did a full preview on this one. Uh, there are some things going on with USC that probably most people don't know about, like Kadon Slovis, what the, his depth of target has been. Uh, how the defense has been reacting for USC. Uh, Some real positive things going on for Brian Kelly and the Notre Dame offense, and they've got a game plan figured out about what snaps Jack Cohn is going to take and what snaps the freshmen are going to take, trying to utilize the legs on some of those freshman kids versus putting Jack Cohn in, who's really threading the needle in a pressured pocket pretty well. So full write-up over at Action Network. Meyer should be back there, stud tight end as well. All right, we've agreed way too much this podcast, so let's. Uh, I'll do one that we're going to disagree on. Fresno State three point favorite over under sixty four and a half at Winbat. Now, what you're going to tell me is that Fresno State's secondary has been elite. Now, if that's the case, Fresno State will win this game. Now, uh, the reason that I love, I mean, I'm, I'm going to bet Nevada here is I was higher on Nevada coming into the season or just about anybody, right? So my prior numbers are still weighing into that right now. So I see value on Nevada. Fresno State, their secondary has been unbelievable this year. But let's let's take a closer look. They played Connecticut, who was playing Zergiatis, the turnover machine, who's now their third-string quarterback. You know, then they played Oregon. We, we don't really love the downfield passing attack of Oregon. Yeah, then they played Cal Poly. Then they played UCLA. You know, they gave up 37 in that game, but that's not a downfield passing attack. You know, then they played UNLV in a game where they were losing at the half until Brumfeld got hurt. And, you know, they lost, they won 38-30. Then they played Hawaii. They lost at Hawaii. And Hawaii's backup quarterback was playing. This isn't the best downfield passing attack in the country. You know, then they played Wyoming who can't throw it downfield and is now talking about a quarterback change. Chambers went eight of 23 for 111 yards. Williams, Levi Williams at one of seven uh, for 32 yards. They had four picks, no touchdowns. So they played a bunch of backups, a bunch of passing offenses that I don't trust. So I'm going to make them prove it to me here. This is the first competent passing offense with an NFL quarter, future NFL quarterback uh, that's going to be behind center. So uh, I'm going pack. If you're right about the second day, Fred well, wins this game. Listen, I, I, I like Fresno State. I, I, I power rate it minus five. Uh, you know, they're, you're right. They have a top 25 coverage rank. Uh, they have a top 20 rank in, in defending the big play, and they're third in defensive havoc. Uh, but there are other things that give me a little bit of a pause, and I wouldn't want to play the three and a half. I'd rather play the three. Mostly, Nevada's rank in passing EPA is 39th in the country, and not that that's, you know, perfect or great, but that's where Fresno State is terrible. Fresno State is 117th on defense in passing expected points. They they can get torn up pretty pretty quick. And then if you turn around and put that into, say, passing downs, uh, you know, Fresno State is extremely successful, but they're outside the top 100 in, in defending explosiveness and passing downs. And that's where I think Carson Strong is going to have a ton of success this game. But Nevada is a pass-happy team anyways. So I think Fresno State's defensive ranks, you know uh, – I would never use the word fraud with a Kalen DeBoer team, but I think Nevada's going to have some success in explosive plays. Now, Fresno State, I think, is the more steady offense. Uh, they're the ones that will have the most success rate, but Nevada can hit the big pass here. So uh, Fresno State minus three, I would not take the three and a half. All right, let's move on to our trash man segment of the week. All right, I'm not taking any trash out this weekend, <laughs> uh, but I think that you are. I so am. you have something in UMass, Florida State. I saw that come through on Sunday. Yep. Yeah, I know. I was, I was, I was going to see if that raised any eyebrows. Listen, I make this game Florida State minus 30. UMass has ran the ball 187 times. They've passed the ball 187 times. Pretty split here. So, they're, you know, they've had plenty of success on the ground. I mean, I know that they, they have an even distribution here, but they've been really pretty okay on the ground. 15 runs over 12 yards. 
And believe it or not, UMass is just shy of the national average and explosive drive percentage. They're around like 11%. So UMass is just a one percentage point shy of the national average and explosive drives. They have a better explosive drive rate than Oklahoma State's offense, to give you any kind of idea of how bad Oklahoma State's explosive drives are. Florida State has Clemson on deck next week, and none of this current coaching staff or players could care less about UMass and Walt Bell. But I got news for you. Walt Bell cares a lot about Florida State. Willie Taggart took away his play calling a few years ago in what was a messy divorce uh, before Walt Bell went off and took the UMass job uh, and Taggart moved on his merry way. So there, this is a really big game. And, you know, for the players for UMass and for their head coach, um, you know, they're going to show up for this one. But that spread is at 35 and a half, way too high. Number I project around 30, probably by it through 35, 34 and a half. I don't know. I, I really like UMass in the spot. Such a big overlook for Florida State. The Walt Bell revenge game. Uh, all right, let's move on to the stick of the week. All right, let's look at the smelliest, fishiest line on the board. You <laughs> could argue NC State only playing three at Miami. I got but I'm gonna say, I'm gonna say this. Look, Hawaii was a 17 and a half point favor at New Mexico State three weeks ago. They covered, and they're a 17 and a half point favorite at home against New Mexico State. They're playing again, by the way, um, this weekend. And all Hawaii's done since is they beat Fresno outright. And, you know, they were right there with, with Devon. I know that there's, I know that there's like quarterback questions with who's going to play for Hawaii, but they're the same spread on the Island. Uh, what do you got? Same Hawaii team that was up 17 to 14. And I had them as a best bet on the BBOC live show and they couldn't cover 14 and a half for me. Thank you very much. Why? Um, listen, this is as stinky as it gets. There's nothing stinkier than what I'm about to tell you. Akron's going to be Buffalo. Uh, <laughs> Buffalo, Buffalo can't. Stinks. Buffalo can't defend the run. They're dead last in passing down success rate. Uh, I know it's Akron, but Buffalo should not be spotting double digits on the road to anybody on the FBS level at all. And so, this kid Gibson's playing well since he came in. Yeah. So listen, uh, don't fall off your chair Saturday morning if the zips happen to come up in the money line round robin, but Buffalo should not be double digits against anybody on the road. All right. Uh, before we get out of here, let's go three and out. All right. First down, we have Friday night lights. We have four games. Eh, none of them really great. Uh, Memphis, two and a half point favorites now at UCF. UCF's just going to train wreck since Gabriel went down and Keen took over. You have Washington, Arizona, Pac-12 after dark. Arizona's lost 18 in a row now. Since yeah. that losing streak started two years ago, when they were four and one, they were top the Pac-12 against Washington, leading at the half. Melted out of the second half, they haven't won a game since. Uh, you see anything in either of these two games? What do you think Khalil Tate's doing these days? Uh, so, the uh, you know, I mean, with Middle Tennessee State and Connecticut, I mean, Middle Tennessee got extremely lucky against Marshall. Uh, but are you going to go and back Connecticut here at home? Um, you know, that that's, that's sort of a dicey role. Now I will probably play Memphis central Florida on the over, uh, you know, I, it's something I projected 61, but both teams are bottom of the barrel in college football for defensive finishing drives. Memphis is one of the most explosive passing teams in the nation. I think Mikey Keene and the offense for UCF is still trying to figure things out, but Memphis is no world beater on defense, especially when it comes to scoring opportunities so I, I i certainly like the over in that game um washington arizona that number should be less than 14 uh, 18 is it's just a can you swallow it with this washington the washington offense is getting better week by week i was a little surprised about they looked competent compared to where they were against michigan like in week two the washington offense looks much better uh now with with dylan morris and and, and all that around them but you know, if you think that you can handle it, uh, Arizona at 18 is is much too high. Two two key numbers there, I think it's crossed. All right, let's move on to second down here. Let's first talk our favorite overdog. For those not familiar, that's our favorite favorite. Easy one for me here. What month is it? It's Brocktober, baby. Iowa State, minus seven. This uh, voodoo party ends for Oklahoma State. Iowa State gets it done here in October. Favorite overdog for you? I'm going to go with Cincinnati. I, I think people are just trying to get too smart here. I, I think Navy's defense is horrible. It's got awful. I'm on Navy. I'm petrified. But in my in fairness, it's just an auto play for me. I uh, play every – so that's – if anyone out there is fine, I put it in the app every time. 
I would not play if I was just looking at this game. And Cincinnati wants to run it up too, so it's a super small play for me. But yeah. I've done it for ten years. Any service, it's like sixty-five percent. This could easily be one of the times where they don't cover. And since he's trying to run it up too, yeah. So I don't necessarily disagree with you, but it's the numbers should not. Do. The numbers should not be this high, but it. I mean, just watch a Cincinnati game, especially in the fourth quarter, to see that Fickle is is sending. He's on an island, like sending signals just for somebody, like a college world playoff committee, to fly by in a plane and see, you know, see me, notice me, please see these scores, like fifty burgers every week. So. Cincinnati blindly till it doesn't happen. Underdog, underdog money line parlay. I'm gonna go. You should have hit yours last night, but last week by the way, with UNLV. Yeah. The quarterback doesn't get hurt. They lose the last second. But um, I'm gonna go with Army. The troops. I think that Wake Forest run defense gets exploited here. The Army defense shows up. Wake's run ends. Yeah. So my underdog money line is uh, I'm gonna go with Oregon State with the Beavers. Could be a ton of pressure here with them uh, possibly taking over the North. But like we said, Utah just comes off this huge emotional week, big win against Arizona State, a tiebreaker that they need in the South. But it's also a Utes team that struggles in the first half to, to wake up. They don't score many points in the first half. Oregon State leads the nation and in, in, in one of the best rushing attacks uh, in third and finishing offensive finishing drives. Uh, they're going to be able to sustain drives. They're going to have drives that go over 10 yards. They pride themselves on time of possession. Uh, Utah is not going to have many chances to score here. And if Oregon State can build a lead in the first half, it's going to be curtains and Corvallis. Agree there. Before we get out of here, third down, our favorite bet of the weekend. I'll let you start. Where are you going? I'm going to go with UCLA Bruins. Chip Kelly is going to beat his former school, Oregon. Uh, this really comes down to two teams that want to establish the run. The problem is, is UCLA just does it a whole bunch better. Uh, not only do they have a two-headed back system with Britton Brown and Zach Charbonnet, who are just creating more missed tackles and yards after contact, uh, they, they have Dorian Thompson Robinson, who is mobile if they get into passing downs. The problem is, is Oregon is just not doing anything defensively. They're outside the top 100 in Havoc. They're outside the top 100 in pass rush. So even if you get Dorian Thompson Robinson in a passing down, you're not going to be able to pressure him into mistakes. This is a UCLA offense that used nine different formations against LSU to get the victory. They're very good at disguising what they want to do. And Oregon's just not going to be able to react. And they're definitely not going to be able to score enough with Anthony Brown at quarterback to keep up with the UCLA Bruins. I think this might be a podcast first should end. Well, uh, my favorite bet also is UCLA. Let's make it a consensus. Uh, said it early in the podcast. I think that UCLA, their run defense has been great. Their secondary little suspect. I don't think Anthony Brown and these Oregon receivers can take advantage. The other side of the ball, you can run on this Oregon team. And I think UCLA can take advantage. Uh, give me the Bruins. Make it a clean sweep for best bets. All right. Thanks, Colin, for joining me. Thanks, everyone, for listening. And thanks for putting up with my voice. I'm about to go sleep for 12 hours, hopefully kick this virus to the curb and then try to find some last-minute winners. Let's have a weekend. Let's get hot and keep it rolling through the end of the year. Appreciate all of you listening. Make sure you subscribe, unsubscribe, subscribe, tell a friend, tell an enemy, leave a review. We'll do some giveaways. We gave a bunch of shit away last episode, but go ahead and leave a review wherever you listen to podcasts, Big Bets on Campus. Make sure you catch us Saturday morning, 10.30 a.m. Eastern for Big Bets on Campus Live. We'll tweet out the link on Twitter. But thanks for listening. We'll see you on Twitter throughout the weekend. Cheers. Peace out.